Okay, so I, I've got some thoughts on where next, and some of you at the workshop heard some of these yesterday, and so I'm, but I'll try to put another spin on them today. And I don't want to uh, do this in the context of uh, where should the language specification go. I want to talk about what we should, what what things will help us that we should do, and. I don't have a slide for this because I, 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 I thought it was kind of pedantic, so I'll just say it. I, I, I would like to say we should learn from programming languages, that they have innovated at the margins, they've innovated in ways where people can try different stuff, and so if you think about it in terms of, in terms of broken chords, uh, um, Okay, where is the mouse? And here we go. If you think about this in terms of libraries or modules, and people create modules all over the place. In JavaScript, they create frameworks all over the place. They just go nuts. Okay, JavaScript is a cacophony that we probably should avoid. But on the other hand, Python's a great example. So take everything I say here, not in my trying to say, oh, I see the future of Bell. It's like, these are experiments that I'd like to do. Um, let me recap so a little context here before I tell you my first thing, which is, you know, what's, what are we really good at? Well. We, one of the things we said yesterday was we're good at compact readable expressions of molecular relationships. And so here's a, here's a, a relationship that's nice and succinct that activity of, of protein X directly increases the activity of protein Y. And that's the kind of qualitative causality that's very common either in text or when somebody just draws a random edge on a diagram, that's often what they mean. Not always, but that's, that's, that's the sort of immediate reading that if just somebody goes A, arrow B, that's what you think they mean. So, okay, that's good. And I'm gonna call that a model-like statement. There's a lot of assumptions built into that, right? Uh, you think you know something about the world, you think you know something about what the characteristic activity of those, of those models, what those molecules are, and that's all unspoken here. It's, you've, you're not just recording observations, you're recording an interpretation of one or many observations. Okay, so we're also good at empirical causal relationships between measurable quantities. And these have always been my favorite Bell statements in current practice. So the increased abundance of protein X phosphorylated at serine 227 increases the abundance of protein Y phosphorylated at serine, uh, tyrosine 25. Cool. Uh, that's a very, uh, that's much closer to what you actually have measured. You poke this, you measure that, you record that empirical fact. And that's more durable. Models come and go. Your, you know, your, your, the idea of having a characteristic activity f for a protein, initially you think it's just a kinase, then you find out it binds to this and that, it's part of a transcriptional complex, it has m multiple uh, functions, like the estrogen receptor. Um, the, uh, sorry, the estrogen receptor is not a kinase, it, but it, it has multiple functions beyond its simple original receptor activity. Um, so I like these better, but I don't think it's enough. Uh, so this is where I want to uh, start adding in, are we doing enough context right now? Well, we do this kind of context. This is really great. We love this context. It allows us to do a lot with understanding where these assertion come, assertions come from, what, what, where we should, if we build a model, how far should we believe this model? So that's great. It, it, it phosphorylates this in the context of human melanoma cell line A375. You have to know something about A375 to really take this much further. And you have to, um, uh, you, you're, you're, we still haven't said anything about how we measured this. And since coming to academia three years ago, I've been exposed to a lot of things that I, I, I didn't know about before because I've talked to a wide, wider variety of people. And I've learned something that 
I keep learning again and again is that you don't know quite what you think you know. Uh, as was said in The Princess Bride, I don't think you know that, that you mean what that word, you know that, what that word means, you know, that uh, the, um, the, the, the anecdote just recently, last two weeks, is I got protein binding experiments explained to me better and like how yeast to hybrid really works. And it's like, holy moly, Ido has been treating this as our bell complex of complex of protein, a, you know, P of A, P of B. Okay, those are protein abundances that are mean, they are the pool of all variants, everything. And so it's a statement that across all the variants, there's binding. And of course, we know it doesn't mean necessarily everything binds to everything. Phosphorylated species may defeat the binding, blah, blah, blah. But it's supposed to be a, a statement about the pool. And then I find out used to hybrid is much more specific than that. You're talking about particular full length transcripts. Urgh. You know, there, now, now, I, now I realize that the, 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 the assumptions, we, we, we just threw away information when we transcribe a used to hybrid experiment that way. So I want fewer assumptions. I want greater transparency. I want the, 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 the findings to be even more durable and more reusable. And so ultimately, I'm interested in building data-driven models. You can see where this is leading because, you know, the stuff in your, the introduction or the conclusions, the results of a given article is largely these model-level statements. In their results section, they actually tell you what they did and what they measured, and hopefully they describe the context well. I want to get that. I don't, want to, I don't want their conclusions, especially I don't want their conclusions from 2004 because it's been a while and we know a lot, other people have done a lot more experiments. Moreover, I really want to capture high throughput experiments well. At Solventa, yeah, we captured microarray experiments and that was extremely helpful. We, we, we made a lot of, of great inferences off of capturing those. Uh, so we had many, many, many statements derived from one experiment I'd like to do a better job of characterizing that context. We didn't annotate with exactly which chip and exactly which probes we were talking about. Because again, later on, you try to, 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 to say something about that probe, and it's not the same as the, 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 the RNA abundance in general. So here's an experiment. I don't claim this is right. I just wanted something evocative that would say what I was thinking about. So differential treatment the abundance of ver vermurathenib, I can never say that. Uh, vehicles, dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, so differential treatment with vermurathenib vehicle DMSO decreases the um, phosphorylated, phosphorylated MAPK1. Okay, not, not determined which phospho, but what I want to you know, record there is it was done with an immunoblot assay and it used antibody CST4370. And I pulled this out of a, a, a paper I found. I just quickly searched for something that was close to my example and then rejiggered this. Okay, is that enough? Well, I, I think we also need time. Uh, there are lots of people in the knowledge, represent, knowledge representation business, including my, my age, ages ago stint at uh, the CYC project by Doug Lennett. Uh, there's time vocabularies out there that are extraordinarily precise. Uh, and so in addition to saying I want the cell line, I want the disease, I want the species, but I also want the time. And in this case, they specifically said it was at 72 hours. Other times you might have, uh, uh, you might, if you record the experiment type, the measurement, the treatment, something like that, that you may also know a time, uh, an implicit time frame, even if they didn't tell you that. Okay, so we want to capture everything we can, but problem, oops, problem, detailed context is hard work. There is a reason we didn't do this at Genstruct. We needed our curators to get to done, and we cost enough as it was, right? And so all of you who've done curation are there shaking your heads saying, oh God, you want, you want our curators to slog through that? Okay, so I have, the following approaches to say, how can we actually get there? 
Uh, I think NL parsing has been, the effort has been misallocated, that people are first and foremost trying to get a hold of those model level statements out of the literature. And the model level statements, especially when somebody's quoting somebody else's work, are often way abstracted into things that have lost all the qualifiers, they've lost all the context, they just want to say, raf, 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 mech, erk, and take that as if it were the gospel. And it, it just, you know, who says that applies in all tissues, really? I mean, yeah, it's pro the, pr the proteins are still there, but it may not be a dominant pathway at all. It may be totally irrelevant, and yet it's gospel. So everybody starts from the idea that that must be it. Whereas if I start from data, then I have a chance of saying something specific about the, 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 um, the situation at hand where I want to make predictions. And uh, Keith was just going on about some work that he's done recently that is a, a, an, another approach in that direction. And at the Eidecker Lab, we have a bunch of uh, data-driven construction of, an, of ontologies. And so I've been very excited by working this, this line. I want to see more of it, and in order to get there, if you have to parse every data set on its own terms, that's a lot of work. If you can partially normalize into low-level Bell, now you have a chance to integrate across many data sets. Okay, so we can partially normalize, I claim, if we focus NL efforts on this, which I think have been entirely, nearly entirely ignored. Oh, there's a few places I've heard about working on this, but if you go to BioCreative, and like there was the BioCreative Bell uh, 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 subsection last year, they're spending a lot of time on that, and they're not filtering out the uh, introduction sections. They're not filtering out conjectures. So um, Anita DeVard at uh, Elsevier, I've been very, she started me thinking about this, of like you need to know the intentional stance, and part of the intentional stance in a, in a paper is just like get rid of those sections because they're, they're quoting somebody else's work and when they quote it, feel, they feel free to be extremely terse, extremely uh, oversimplified. And so it's terrible stuff to parse, it's a total waste of time. And so I watched the parse go by in a recent, uh, an ongoing project we're doing for DARPA where there are several natural language processors working. And yeah, every time I turn around, they're disambiguating RAS, RAF, MAC. Gah! Uh, over and over and over again because it's in every introduction. Okay, large scale studies with many results in the same context. Okay, then it's worth your time. If somebody spent half a million dollars doing this set of, of, of work, then it's worth your time, it's worth the author's time to go and be careful about representing it. And you can, it's worth time for knowledge engineers to help them do that. Author tools, journal uh, requirements. I have been surprised in talking to some of our contacts at El Elsevier in, recently, for example, where when discussing like what hurdles they might be willing to put, put their authors through in terms of capturing more nuanced representations of what's in this article, I was surprised <laughs> that they actually were much more open to that than I thought. I, perhaps they just are there, haha, -ha, you know, we're the gatekeepers, you want, your, you want to get published? Suck it up. Uh, moreover, I think the NL comes back here again. Um, there's a difference between static N NL where I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, we're just taking their statements, they're taking their articles, and we're trying to one pass, get it right. So uh, as part of this DARPA program, uh, I've been really impressed by uh, some of the competition, Emic Demir, uh, you know, an architect of Biopax. Uh, Emic's got an awesome demo right now of because he's worked with all of these other natural language groups and he, they, he's modified his uh, web-based Biopax editor so that it takes in this stuff interactively. So you're there typing and saying something and he's saying more model-like statements, okay? And dynamically stuff appears. 
And then you can look at it right then and see what the machines identified and say, no, 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 not that. And try it again. Try phrasing it a, a different way and, you know, get a, and so the machine trains you as to what the parser is good at. Okay, so I think that we can address these in the, those ways and get ourselves a much more rich representation. Okay, how much time have I got? Because I, I, I knew this was supposed to be my big topic and I'm going to rush through the other two topics. Uh, got it. At least 10 minutes, maybe a little longer. Okay, this is one I particularly liked, so I've, I've dwelled here. Um, okay, the other thing we really do is, you know, we pioneer the, the concept of assembly. Don't start by building the model, start by assembling facts. What kind of model do you want? And the, um, uh, I really started believing in that uh, at the one time, 2007 or eight, where I rewrote the, um, the, 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 the Bell inference engine. And what I did was I said, I, I don't want most of the model here f to, uh, to, to do upstream controller analysis. And we'd been doing something where we traversed a complex model, and it was pretty slow. And so I, I was like, the, the light dawned. And so I built a model that was optimized solely to do upstream controller computation. And something that had been hours ran in a tenth of a second. Yeah, different needs, different models. Um, but you know, our the current practice. If most of us talk about the Bell compiler, well, the Bell quote unquote the Bell compiler produces a particular kind of model as its output. It's one that preserves a lot of the Bell semantics. That's a great compiler. I I actually really really want a, a new one that I can easily plug into stuff. Uh, but uh, it's not the only thing. And so I think we really need to let a thousand assemblers bloom. And so I want to talk to you about something, uh, uh, first of all, uh, encourage the development of diverse task-oriented assemblers, create models to meet user needs, and you know, accelerate adoption by accommodating non-Bell inputs. Some of the things that we want to assemble, you know, let's just take the PPI stuff in directly. Don't say it all has to first be turned into Bell complex statements. Just make the, you know, start your assembler on the, on the idea that you can take different kinds of things into your master model of semantics that you then are assembling models from. And you, you, the range of things that you're good at, well, you're, will be different depending on who's building the assembler and what range of models they're interested in building. So now I want to, whoops, now I want to talk to you about our collaborators in the DARPA project. Uh, the Sorger Lab at Harvard Med. And uh, particularly, uh, John Bachman and Ben Giori uh, have been drivers in the system I'm about to describe. Uh, so, you know, I want to tell you that they are just super. If you get a chance to collaborate with them, uh, they're right up there with the, the, the best people I've ever worked with. Um, okay, this is one of their slides. I sold them on knowledge assembly a couple of years ago, and they've run, they ran with it. They've taken it far beyond you know, what I've ever done with it. And so they've got a multi-source assembler that takes it directly in natural language in output from a couple of different parsers. They take uh, you know, literature parsed information, both from biopacks and from uh, like the Bell Large Corpus. I wish I could feed them the Bell full, full corpus, if we ever figure out how to get, liberate that. Um, I'd like to feed, I know, you know, out there in the Bell world, there's been a bunch of people building other separate models. Uh, you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to arrange to f get those queued up to, to feed them as input. And so, uh, and, and then they, there's ways in which they're also just having expert input for uh, selecting which papers to parse. So that you, you, instead of just saying, we'll parse everything and sort it all out, it's like, okay, we could be guided in some of the models we want to build. Um, they produce, um, their, pre, their prior work in that lab had produced a language called PiSB, which attacked the longstanding problem of uh, uh, executable models being hell to build, and even worse hell to try and update. And so they said, we need to go take a software engineering approach from this. There's sort of a m set of macros that we're going to have a language in that then compile to differential equation models, compile to uh, 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 stochastic models. And so 
that's one style of model they build out of this. And so there's places where Bell statements have been used as inputs to create executable models along with other informations. Uh, in particular, one thing where we're going with this that hasn't really bloomed yet is the executable model can profit from knowing Bell qualitative relationships. At the end of the day, you have a qualitative relationship that says at 72, to 72 hours, that phosphoprotein is down. Okay, that's a constraint on their model. If, you're, if their model doesn't recover that, uh, not quite right. Um, they want more contextual data. And again, Bell helps provide, is, is good at capturing context where people building models, literature models, are again often use forms that don't lend themselves to capturing context. And then they also output these mechanistic networks. And then one of those mechanistic networks, Dan Carlin, who works with me, has been like, he wants to do heat diffusion. So he just throws away even more information, makes balls and sticks, and diffuses heat and gets interesting results because for certain kinds of analyses that's actually the most important thing just the topology and then diffusing heat on it so here's the it doesn't matter exactly what the, the, the all the individual boxes here are in this this diagram I'm putting it here to say yeah they did a bunch of work they've done a bunch of work they're doing more about saying there's lots of output assemblies there's lots of input sources and I think this is a great thing to look at as for something you might try adopting, you might talk to them about using this, but taking it as a model for saying, well, okay, they built their internal data model, there are limits, there are biases in how they are assembling, what's your take? Um, okay, last thing, five minutes, four minutes? Perfect. Okay outreach to other communities and there's a broad range of things and this is where I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the other work that I do here with the index project as one example of outreach where Bell is being carried along as part of the outreach that I do uh, and my team does uh, and I'll point out that I actually have a staff position that I don't think anybody else at UCSD has I have an outreach person at my applications manager and I specifically designed my team to say I need that person I don't need programmers being part-time on that I need somebody who started as a biologist and has a good personality to get out there and talk to people and can't uh, but is technical enough to interface with the developers so in the in in back in the commercial world they'd be an applications engineer or part of a, a marketing person or some combination a software evangelist those that all of those thing, words kind of converge on what I wanted. Okay, sophisticated representations only work if somebody uses them. We want more people using this. We want this room to be full sometime in the future. Um, and also I want to say avoid silo by syntax. So there are a bunch of other people who are working on causal representations and they're, you know, we need to bridge. We, there, I, I, there's a whole bunch of data of knowledge that I'm going to talk about that's in, some of which is either already an index or is on its way there with collaborations that is causal and it's got a little bit different syntax and semantics but we ought to figure out how to get stuff together and vice versa encourage them to, to say can you capture the context and stuff that we capture. Sometimes we may persuade them that they want to use Bell. Other times it's like, no, we got our we got our process. We'll stick with that. So index uh, is a the network data exchange. It is a commons for networks. It is very ecumenical. You can stick almost any network into our our very flexible data model for, that goes in and out of it. And it's pure REST API. It's not your business what we do with it internally. We basically just have an API that says, you give us networks <clears throat> in this format, we'll index them for search, we'll give them back to you, we'll give you libraries that know how to grab them and, uh, and know how to give you a first cut data model. But you can do your own data model if, if ours isn't what you, you know, ours isn't convenient for you. We get a, we're, we're, we're a sibling group on, in the IDECAR lab with Cytoscape get connected to Cytoscape because there's a ton of Cytoscape users out there. How do you make it so that our stuff is right on their doorstep? Um, so 
Signor and the uh, work that Sandra Orchard has done at EBI are the two things that I'm particularly talking about, about getting the other forms of causal knowledge. These guys have converged that they're both talking about using the same syntax, um, but they're separate, separate curation efforts. And together, the, you know, it's not a huge corpus of causal information, but uh, I don't want to ignore it. It's, and it's, it's, it's not huge, but it's significant. There's, a, there's value there. I'd like to be getting in many of the other Bell networks that uh, have come from uh, other folks and, again, get them in the one place where everybody can see them. And notably, this is like Google Docs for Scientists with Networks. You get to control who sees stuff. You can start with pre-publication collaboration. You don't have to make this public until you're, you're ready. We're working with first with El Elsevier on direct embedding of networks in publications. So we're trying to create a publication path once you're ready to not just turn it on and make it searchable for anonymous users in our system, but directly connected to, to, to the thing you just published. And so I want Bell deeply in this, both on the data capture side of systematically generated networks and on the curated side. And what happened? Is that the, that's not, okay, uh, right, okay, there we go. Uh, this is just saying, here's an example of a Bell network in index. You know, it's preserving the full, full semantics. So it's a storehouse that you can put Bell in, the, the original documents. It's also a place like uh, with JGF, we're working with Anselmo on getting a, a JGF to Bell compiler, uh, not translator, so that we can store JGF here. I'm sorry, JGF to CX, our, our standard. Our CXs are, data, are extremely flexible standard. I'll talk to people offline about what it's good for. It gets us connected to Cytoscape with lossless uh, round tripping. And here's an example of a multi-application workflow. I want to say, look, get your stuff into Bell, assemble your Bell, put your model back in, now operate on it with utilities that you didn't think about before, uh, merge it with a, a database of compound to protein interactions, have an annotated model that tells people like what tool compounds they might want to operate on on the model, format that in Cytoscape, put it back into index, publish it, make it available with a web-based display in your article. So, done. <laughs>